Well, blessings, everybody, and welcome to Answers. I am Dale. I'm so glad that you had joined with me today. Uh, this is a program, if you haven't been with us before, where we simply uh, look in the Word of God and say, Lord, we have questions about some things. Give us your answers. Give us your understanding. Uh, the Lord has given us everything that we need. Uh, if you are a believer in the Most High God, if you've called upon the name of the Lord, if you have repented and confessed and said, Lord, save me, He has. And He has equipped you for everything that you will ever encounter. He has given everything that you need or will need. The problem we have most of the time is waiting, okay? And waiting for God's timing with some things. So anyway, that's what we do on the program is we examine the Word of God. And so we're in the midst of a, a time that we're going to be looking at some things over a period of time. It may take us a few weeks. It may take us a few months. I remember one time when we first started the program, I thought I would look at a passage and thought, oh, I bet it'll take us like six weeks to, uh, to go through that particular idea and that concept. I think we spent nine months on it. Nine months. Uh, not just on the one thing, but all the various corollaries and the streams and the things that were entailed uh, with, with end time things, last days kind of stuff, okay? And we still talk a whole lot about that kind of thing. What we're looking at now are, are some things that uh, it's an overarching type of thing, and it has to do with what is often referred to as spiritual warfare, okay? Spiritual warfare. Because people have questions about such things. Uh, are, are there such things as demons? Is there such a thing as Satan? A devil? And most times people say, well, of course there is. You know, everybody knows that. Well, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, how do we uh, uh, experience a spiritual warfare? Are we in a battle? You know, what is happening in the midst of all these things? I thought we were saved. If we're saved, isn't everything just going to be fine? Isn't everything going to be hunky-dory, as they say? And so we're going to be looking at this as a big broad stroke thing over the next few weeks. You know, some week I may come in here and say, hey, i got to deal with something today, a little different, a little rabbit chasing. But generally speaking, we're going to be looking at this because I think it's really, really a word for us for such a time as this because the Scripture tells us that in the last days that evil will increase. And we've seen it just in my lifetime, okay, how evil is increasing around the world. And so last week we uh, looked in Genesis, the third chapter of Genesis, at the initial encounter where we look at the one that's referred to as Satan, the devil. And we saw how he tempted uh, Eve and how Eve was tempted, Eve was deceived, but how Adam, man, sinned. And we saw the ramifications of that in chapter uh, 3 of Genesis, verses 1 through 15. Today we're going to leap to the other end of the Bible to start, okay? We're going to go to Revelation just to see... Uh, a little bit about who the devil is because if we're going to really understand spiritual warfare and the battle that we are in and what is occurring and what is happening, then we need to know who the enemy is. Okay, uh, We really, as the body, go to the extremes in this thing. Quite often, people will go to one extreme and say, oh, there's, there's no enemy, there's no devil, there's nothing like that. That's one extreme. The other extreme is that of absolute uh, paralysis in fear of the evil one. Both are in error, okay? I'll tell you right now, the devil, the evil one, Satan, uh, he's a powerful being. He is real. He's dangerous. But we're not to live in fear of he and his minions. Not at all. We're not to live in fear of them. And so in Revelation 12, we see something sort of interesting. What's going on in Revelation 12 is there's, uh, it describes a war in heaven. We're not going to get into the details as to what that war is, when that war is, or anything like that, because that's beyond what we're going to be looking at today. But I just want you to see something here. So it's Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with a dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. So what we see here is that Michael and the angels, this is Michael the archangel, and we see, you see Michael through scripture in several places. He's waging war with the dragon. You, we'd already been introduced in Revelation to a dragon. Well, the dragon has his angels, and he's waging war. But he wasn't strong enough. Wasn't strong enough for what? Well, strong enough apparently to stay where they were, because it says and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Intriguing thing, no longer a place found for them in heaven. Listen to the next verse. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down 
with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Now, boy, in those four verses right there, we learn some serious things about who the devil is. Let me just point them out. We learn that he's described here and is pictured here in Revelation, as John saw him, as a dragon. Okay, a dragon. Also, he has angels. He has those who follow him. And you say, well, where in the world uh, did this come from? The devil, Satan, his name was Lucifer. And I believe, okay, according to what the scripture says, what you see in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, I think, uh, gives us some insight into this, uh, that he was the chief worship leader in heaven. He was the one that led the worship of the Most High God until iniquity was found within him. An intriguing phrase, until iniquity was found within him. He exalted himself and he wanted to ascend to the position of God. He wanted to be God. And, and one of those passages, he says uh, five times, I, 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 I. Okay? He wanted to ascend the mount. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to do this. And God said, no. no that's not going to happen. And the Lord removed him from that position. They removed him that, from that position. Now, this gets sort of interesting, and there's, a, there's debate over this, okay? So I don't want to be dogmatic about the time and even of this Revelation 12 passage. But this is what I'm thinking right now with my understanding from the Word that the Lord literally cast him out of that position right there, but that Satan still has access to heaven. He can still come as one of the sons of God before God. You see this in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, that Satan still has access. Well, when God kicked Satan out of his worship position, kicked him out of heaven from that stance, a third of the angels went with Satan. That is an amazing thing. Just think on that. They had been before the very presence of the Most High God. They had seen him in all of his splendor and all of his glory. And yet they left the Most High God and went with Lucifer. It shows us uh, the attraction and the power of the one that we refer to now as the evil one. They come to earth. They're the ones that are called demons now. The demons are the angels that rebelled against God. Now the time that's being spoken of right here, I believe, is the time yet to come. When it says right here that this great dragon will be, there's no longer a place found for him in heaven. Right now he has access and comes back and forth. The Lord asked him in, first, in the first chapter of Job, he looks at Satan and says, uh, where have you been? And Satan says, oh, I've been roaming about to and fro up on the face of the earth. You know? But he has access before God. Now, there's all sorts of questions that we know, don't know answers to. Why does God allow this? You know, that kind of thing. But what we see right here is that there's no longer a place found for them. So there's a battle that's going to take place where they're ultimately totally kicked out of heaven. And there's no longer a place found for him. I think it's at this point in time right here that the, uh, he comes and indwells the human that will be called the man of lawlessness. But that's another issue. We learned that Satan has several names right here. And it really brings all these things together throughout the entire Bible. He's the great dragon. He's the serpent of old. The serpent of old, the one we saw in Genesis 3 last week. The serpent of old. The devil, who's called the devil and Satan. So all of these terminologies are brought together in, and we see that it's the same individual. In the last verse it says that about the salvation that now, a great voice in heaven says now, at this time after this has happened, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Why? For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down so he's called the accuser of the brethren. That's the passage. If you've ever heard Satan being called the accuser of the brethren, who accuses them before God day and night. He brings accusations before God uh, against those that are believers. And so he's still doing that at this point in time. But there's a time coming where he, the accuser of the brethren, the serpent of old, the great dragon, the devil, the Satan, all the same person, will be cast down. But it shows, it shows us some uh, serious characteristics right here about who the evil one is and what he does. He brings accusation. So, we, we, we've seen some tremendous insights as to who he is. I want to go to another passage here. This is in Matthew, uh, Matthew 13. And we're going to see uh, somehow the enemy does some things, okay? Matthew chapter 13. Uh, I'm reading this from a computer thing on my uh, Bible study on my computer, as you can tell right here. Um, what was going on right here is that the uh, Jesus was telling a parable. He tells a parable about a guy who owns some land. 
and he sowed seed upon the land. When he'd sowed seed upon the land at night, an enemy came in and sowed what's called tares, uh, which are weeds, just weeds. But they look like the real thing. They look like the real thing while they, spr while they sprout forth, they come forth, you think you've got a wonderful harvest. And then you find out when the harvest time comes that a portion, sometimes a large portion, of that harvest is not truly what you thought, let's say wheat, it wasn't anything like that, that it was a tear, that it does not produce good fruit. So that's the context right here. So Jesus starts speaking in Matthew 13, verse 37. He's interpreting it for him. He said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the world. Okay, he's showing them how to interpret this thing. As for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. Sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. You know, this is one of the most useful passages right here. Because quite often, you know, Jesus doesn't want us to walk about in confusion. A lot of times we'll say, oh, I don't understand the word. I don't understand the parables. They're so complicated. No, no. Jesus gives the explanation on several of the parables. The disciples said, can you tell us what this means? And he tells them. Right here, he tells us what each one of these things stand for. He says the good seed is the Son of Man. The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So the Son of Man is coming along and sowing the good seed. The one who sowed the bad seed is the devil. So what do we learn about the devil right here? We've learned that he will sow seed and that his seed is bad. What else have we learned? Think about it for a moment. We've seen that the enemy will seek to sow his evil seed, his bad seed, in the midst of good seed. Think about that. He says that the field is the world. Okay, the field is the world. So what's the enemy trying to do? Trying to sow his evil seed in the midst of the world. He said the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. Okay, the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the reapers are the angels. And the harvest is the end of the age. So what he's saying, and he tells you, when we look at the entire passage here in Matthew and some of the other gospels that give a full understanding of it. Uh, there's some confusion here because they said, well, what should we do? Do we need to go out here to this field and try to reap, you know, rip up these tares? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Leave the tares where they are, lest you cause greater harm to the good wheat. We don't want to do that. But in the last days, in the harvest times, the Lord will send forth his angels, will send forth his reapers. They will bring forth the harvest. They will bind the good harvest together. Then they will bind the bad harvest together, take the bad harvest and throw it into fire. Now what does that tell us? What does that show? It shows us some serious things. It shows us that the evil one has a strategy. And one of his major strategies is to sow that evil seed among the good seed. In the world, yes, but especially, especially in among the body of Christ. Especially within the church. Uh, I'm doing an, uh, an online Bible study right now on the book of Jude. And the book of Jude shows us some tremendous truths related to that. That these evil people will rise up from within you and among you. They've crept in among you. That is one of the strategies of the evil one. And we also see that the Lord is totally aware of that. He's totally aware that there will be, I think, many, many people that will be actively involved in religious things that will consider themselves to be righteous, that will consider themselves to be good, that will consider themselves to be religious people. But they are tares. They look like a religious person. They have the practices, okay? They go to uh, religious services. They participate. They do all these kind of things. They may even be nice, sweet, kind, and all this kind of thing, but they're truly not saved. They will look just like the real thing, but when it time, comes time for the harvest to break forth and for there to be true fruit, the true fruit will not be there. And that's what the Lord is showing us here in these parables and about the strategy of the evil one, okay, how he does things. You see the same kind of thing with the parable of the sower where the, um, the seed is sowed <coughs> and some of it lands on rocky soil. Some on the uh, side of the road, some of it actually breaks forth, but then when the sun gets hot, it melts down. You actually see four different types of soil, four different types of situations. Only one of them, only one of them actually brings forth 
the type of fruit that is evidence of a truly repentant, transformed kingdom of the Most High individual. Think about that. Does that mean, can we say that three-fourths of the people who sit there and say, oh yeah, I believe, I believe that three-fourths of them perhaps don't? I don't think we can come back dogmatically and say, okay, no, no, you do, you do. No, we can't say that. But boy, that's something I keep in mind all the time. That if I'm sitting there sharing, if I'm talking with somebody, I'm just not going to assume that because you're really involved in church and you may be in every leadership position, you may do this, you may do that. But you know, the scripture tells us, examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. Not to bring confusion into your life, not to do all this, no, not to bring doubt, never. But examine yourself. Walk in humility before the Lord and see where you stand. Because when you see these examples right here, these parables of the sword, these parables of the wheat and the tear, it's going to be a lot of folks who they themselves really think they are saved. And they're not. Remember the passage in Matthew 7 when Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many, many miracles in your name? But Jesus said, in that day I will look at them and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you. See, that's one of the biggest strategies of the evil one, is to get us to think that we're doing a good religious thing, that we're nice people, and we really are. We're not out trying to kill somebody. You're nice, yeah. Has nothing to do with being truly saved. Tell you what, we're going to take a quick break right here. Think about these things for a moment, and we'll be right back, okay? You have always wanted to play the piano, but thought it was too late. Or, in the past you played the piano, but you do not play anymore. Or, you've always considered yourself to be unmusical, yet there is something driving you to express yourself through music. It is not too late. Now is the time. Simply Music has come to Alabama. Coleman is the only Alabama location of this revolutionary method. Come, join us, make music. back to answers. You know, we're looking at some pretty, a lot of times people would say, oh, this is heavy stuff. This is serious stuff. I, I don't like you even using the terms heavy or deep. Oh, so often people say, well, this is such deep stuff. I understand what people say. You know, I understand what they mean. Uh, but sometimes I think we draw lines of demarcation that just don't belong there. It's just the truth of the Most High God, and the Lord reveals truth to each one of us at the time when we need it, as we search out His Word, as we pray, as we listen to the Spirit. And so don't think of it being deep things or difficult things or hard things. Though there are things that are easier to understand and things hard to understand. Just think of them as being the truth of the Most High God and just be so open to that and say, Lord, I want to know more. I want to know what's happening in my life. I want to know what's occurring. And, what's, and Lord, what can we be doing here? Because we are in a spiritual battle. We're going to see more about that next week, okay? That we are in a battle. We are in a war. And we have an enemy. That's what we've been examining here these last two weeks. Our enemy is the devil. He is Satan. As a matter of fact, you see those terms used, used in Scripture. Uh, the terms Satan and the devil uh, talk about the same entities we're just talking about. Satan appears 54 times in the Old and New Testament, while the devil is used 35 times only in the New Testament. The actual word devil means the accuser, the slanderer. What did we see a while ago? That he's the accuser of the brethren. Satan means adversary, the enemy. That's the reason we, we use the phrase the enemy all the time or the evil one, because he is an adversary. Um, let me read a passage here. This is just one verse out of uh, John, the 8th chapter, 44th verse. What's going on here? Jesus is speaking to a group of religious leaders. 
and they refuse to listen to the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. He's speaking the truth to them. They're just being argumentative. And Jesus just finally tells them what the truth is in relationship to them. Now, th this is Jesus speaking to religious rulers. Think about this. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Can you imagine? This is the Most High God, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to the religious leadership of the Jewish people. They refuse to listen. So he just, just cuts to the absolute bottom line truth and says, here's what the problem is. You're of your father, the devil. Now think about that. He was saying your action, your deeds, everything about you is of the father. Not the father above, but your father, the devil. Now what's really intriguing about this is in Matthew, Jesus tells the, uh, the people, he says, when you give heed to what the religious rulers are teaching you, when they're speaking from the seat of Moses, he said, because they're speaking truth. They would speak forth the truth of the word, but he says, do not do what they are doing. Classic definition of a hypocrite. They were speaking forth the truth. He said, give heed to that, what they say, because they're sitting in the seat of Moses, the, the rule of authority, and they're speaking forth the words of God. But don't do what they do. Here, he's telling them, let me just tell you what your motivation is. Your motivation is that of your father, the devil, and it's the same desires. In other words, your motivation, your desire is of the devil himself. And then he tells, he reveals their heart because they were so mad at him that they had already started to plan on doing something. They were trying to kill Jesus. They were discussing how they were going to go about doing that. And so he just deals with it. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning. Satan, the devil, the enemy was the murderer from the beginning. I want to ask you this question. I'm going to ask Danny this question. I'm going to let him answer it for me after we get done, okay? He was a murderer from the beginning of what? What do you think, Danny? From the beginning of what? He was a murderer from the beginning? From the beginning of, from the time when he was cast out of heaven to earth? From the beginning of the time when he was created? Was he a murderer from the, from the beginning of the time when he rebelled against God? Was it that? We don't have a clear-cut verse that says, okay, this is what this means. But it does show us some things. Angels are created beings, just like we're created beings. We have the ability to receive and accept and walk in obedience to God. Adam and Eve had one rule, don't eat of the tree. They chose to walk in rebellion. The angels, Lucifer and the angels that went with him, rebelled against God, which shows us that angels had, have, had? I'm not sure. I think it was had, definitely. I don't know if they still have this or not. Had the ability to reject God and to walk away. You see? And so when it's saying, even when uh, uh, Satan, Lucifer, was the chief worship leader and was worshiping God, there was still the ability within him to reject God, and ultimately he did reject God. So I think that's what he's talking about right here. He was a murderer. From the beginning, he had the ability to do that. When he rejected God, he then did become a murderer. And he doesn't stand in truth because there's no truth in him. Now that's interesting because he says right here that he's just, uh, there's no truth in him. And he says, and he speaks a lie. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. And you say, well, a lot of times people will say, well, I thought anytime Satan says something, it was a lie. No, 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 no. Nope. Because remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan? The Spirit leads Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And so the uh, first temptation came because Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry, nearly to the point of death. And the Lord said, hey, uh, and we're going to see some more about this next week, I think, or the week after this. And uh, uh, so he's hungry. Satan comes to him and tries to get him to create his own bread. And he says, no, he quotes scripture. Well, the next time that Satan seeks to tempt Jesus, Satan quotes scripture. You see a couple of occurrences where Satan himself quotes the word of the Most High God. Well, it's not a lie. 
It's the absolute truth, but he's trying to use the truth of God as a lie, and he's trying to use the truth of God to pervert it. The enemy does that quite, quite often. And so this verse right here gives some clarity. It says this, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He looked at Eve and said, oh, you're not going to die when you eat that fruit. No, you're just going to be wise like God. That was Satan speaking from his own very nature, speaking forth a lie. But he was perverting and twisting what the Lord says. That is exactly, exactly what he does today. And so, I want to look at a couple things here in our closing time, okay? We've just got another minute or two here. I want you to understand that we have an enemy, okay? He's powerful. He's powerful. But he's not to be feared because of what I'm going to tell you right now. The Lord Jesus Christ is victorious over him. The Lord is victorious, the Lord continues to be victorious, and the Lord will be victorious over him. Because of that, we can live lives of victory in the Lord over the evil one. Okay? And we're going to learn how, more how to do it. But we need to know how his strategies are. We need to know that he's sly. We need to know that he has schemes. We're going to see that later. Several scripture passages talk about the schemes of the evil one. He has a scheme and a plan for each one of us individually. He has schemes and plans for families. We'll look at that down the road too. But you can look at families right now, our own personal families, and you can see how the enemy has used a particular type of, a, a particular kind of strategy over the generations. Over the generations, okay? So he has a strategy. You also see that the enemy will come in very subtly and he seeks to be in the midst of where the good seed is, over the world, the good seed that the Lord has spread. In the midst of the body of Christ, the church, the enemy will try to come in and do some things. And then we've also seen that the enemy is a liar. And when he speaks of himself, he speaks only lies. But he will also take the truth of the word of God and try to twist it. And it will sound so good. It will sound so reasonable. It'll make total sense. It'll sound great. It'll sound wonderful. One of the major deceptions that the enemy uses in the world and in the body of Christ. Do not be deceived. And remember this. Greater is he that is in you, that is in us, than he that is in the world. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you are victor victorious over the enemy. And Lord, that we in you and you in us can walk in victory. Lord, that we need not be deceived. Lord, we'll see some things in future weeks about how to keep from walking in deception and then how to walk in victory. Lord, I pray that you will just give us more and more understanding and that we will be victorious vessels of your very presence. Lord, I thank you for this time together and we just bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with me uh, here on Answers. If you missed some of these episodes, just go to my website. It's just dalemore.tv, and uh, you can find all these things. You can find past episodes or watch them again, okay? I'll see you again next time.